Welcome to Brooklyn Booksmith's author event series. My name is Silas Weiner, and I'm a member of the events team here at Brooklyn Booksmith. If you're familiar with our store, welcome back. If this is your first time joining us, allow me to extend a warm virtual welcome. We're so excited that you're all here this evening to celebrate the release of Kosher Soul, the faith and food journey of an African-American Jew. And we invite you again, drop those questions and we'll answer them at the end of the hour. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce author Michael Twitty and our moderator, Rabbi Toba Spitzer. The rabbi is a popular teacher of courses on Judaism and economic justice, Reconstructionist Judaism, new approaches to thinking about God, and the practice of integrating Jewish spiritual and ethical teachings into our daily lives. She served as the president of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical Association until 2009, and was the first LGBTQ rabbi to head the National Rabbinic Organization. Since 1997, she has been the spiritual leader of Congregation Dorshai Sedek in Newton, Massachusetts. And folks, you should know that she recently published a work of her own titled God is Here, Reimagining the Divine, which is a book of popular theology that is already transforming hearts, minds, and lives. Welcome, Rabbi. Thank you. Michael W. Twitty is a James Beard award-winning author of The Cooking Gene. He is a cook, a teacher, a writer, a culinary historian, and yes, he has a master class, just in case you were wondering. You can find more of Michael on his blog, Afro Culinaria, where he further explores the culinary traditions of Africa, the African-American South, and the African diaspora at large. To quote an excellent profile, by Garden and Gun magazine that I encourage you all to read. He calls what African Americans have accomplished with food edible jazz and says of cooking, you have to have reverence. If it doesn't have reverence, it ain't got no flavor and it got no spice and it ain't got no soul. And this is really the thesis of Kosher Soul in which Michael considers the marriage of two of the most distinctive culinary cultures in the world today the foods and traditions of the African Atlantic and the global Jew Jewish diaspora. To Twitty, the creation of African Jewish cooking is a conversation of migrations and a dialogue of diasporas offering a rich background to explore inventive recipes and the people all about it. Rabbi Toba Spitzer and author Michael Twitty. Thank you. Thank you, Silas. Wow, I'm really honored to be in conversation with you, Michael. And I just, I've Thank just you. completed your book today, and it is fabulous um, for folks who probably haven't gotten it yet. Because I think it's just coming out. It's this amazing. Uh, it's it's beyond anything I can really describe. Hopefully, you'll, you'll get a sense of it. Over the <laughs> evening, but it um it inc includes history and personal narrative and um and f and recipes and um. It's just, it's beautiful, it's, it's beautiful. So I wanted to, I thought maybe Michael, I'd start with a couple quotes and then it sort of just introduce this to give people a little bit of a flavor as it were, uh, mm -hmm. unintended. Um, so a lot of the book, I, I really, one of the things you did that I enjoyed was sort of these conversations between yourself and other folks who um, either share your exploration of, of, of cooking in the, Black and or Jewish world or themselves are Black Jews and, and their journey. So I wanted to begin with a quote you bring for someone who's been a teacher for me and I know for many of us, uh, Yabila McCoy. So this is a quote, I believe this is, this is all her. So she said, for me, and you bring this near the beginning of the book, for me, soul is the wellspring of Blackness that comes to me from the physical and spiritual DNA in my ancestral line. Soul informs and shapes my being and expresses itself through me, often without words. It's in my food, my music, my laughter, my rhythm and movement, my sense of awe and inspiration in all things living and that have lived on this earth. Kosher soul is the way that I live soul in connection to my practice of Judaism. Mm -hmm. I believe that once upon a time in my ancestral memory, there was not a need to explain or affirm the organically braided relationship between soul and Jewish in practice. I found this next sentence very powerful. White supremacy has robbed the Jewish people and the world of many things, including in many cases, our shared memory of Jewish soul and our shared experience of Jewish culture manifesting beyond the paradigm 
of Europeanness and whiteness. Um, and then a little later, you introduce your own journey and you write, I wanted to discover us, but really I had to dis discover myself and why my story mattered in the, in the context of a constellation of other stories. To paraphrase a frequently quoted rabbinic piece of wisdom, to save one story is to save the entire world. What mattered was not that our kosher soul had rules and boundaries and lines, but that we each catered our culinary and cultural coping mechanisms to the unique journeys we faced as individuals. Trying to navigate two very rich traditions and melding or separating them when mood and message mattered, that was what kosher soul was really about. The goal of this book became to remove all the labels, not create another. There's an enormous amount in the paragraph, but I wondered if maybe you can unpack it a little bit for us in terms sure. of what, what you were trying to achieve with this book. Yeah. So the minute you say, the minute I say kosher soul, as the minute people attach it to food, they want to know what are the what are the boundaries, what are the rules, what are the ingredients, what's the pantry look like, what are the techniques. A word I hate more than authenticity is technique, mm. because it's because it's because it's associated with a certain type of um, elite cuisine. You know, not just French cuisine, but I mean the court cuisine, right? And it's the assumption is that you've got some wizardry that nobody else knows and can do and impress me. And it's not about that. I mean, you know, Jewish food has never, and black food have never been about impress me. You know, they've always been about, they've always been about kind of a, kind of a survivor's shock and awe. You know, I you mean, you've seen a, 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 a one of those 40 foot long challahs. <laughs> <laughs> it's not perfect, not tasty all the time, but it's beautiful, yes? Because it's part of Hidor Mitzvah. And so, and, and there's also that thing where, you know, in our traditions, you, someone's either a really great cook or they're not a great cook, but they put, put a lot of food out. You get, you get one of the two, you don't get, rarely do you get a mixture of both. And so there's that. And so I didn't want to write something that people could go, you know, I was, I was laughing because I was watching, I've been watching a lot of things and trying to absorb a lot. Um, and um, I was watching the um, Andy Warhol diaries and it talked about the preppy handbook. And I just thought to myself, oh my God, the preppy handbook, the grunge dictionary, the hipster dictionary and handbook, these are all made up. Somebody made this nonsense up so they could, you know, hook on to a trend. I didn't want it, I didn't want it, want this to be about that. I want this to be about people's really their lived experience, their lives, what they meant to them. I want to do do something totally different. I didn't want to brand anybody. I didn't want to do anything that might be morally, ethically irresponsible in putting on, you know, people had conversations with so, something that they didn't ascribe to. So I just left kosher so open. It's like <laughs> some some ridiculous person. Um, or you had a, you know, responded to the galley and said, oh, yam kugel, it's because it's just because you slap yam when it's making a kugel. And I was, I was so offended because I was like, you don't get the point, you don't get it. That kosher soul comes from Mrs. Mildred Covert. Mrs. Mildred Covert, of blessed memory, grew up in the deep south, very clear eyed about the influence of black cooks on Jewish food in the deep south that she grew, grew up with. Mm -hmm. I mean, these communities, were like no other. I mean, they, their food was thoroughly mixed between African American and Ashkenazi Jewish. You, you normally, normally, um, you may ask yourself, well, why not Sephardic? Because <laughs> I figured this out. They had the same ingredient, the key ingredients. They didn't have the same key flavors though. Wow. So okra, rice, um, melon, um, um, polenta slash mamaliga, corn porridge. You get it, eggplant, tomato, were all the same, but they didn't want them to be prepared in a way they weren't familiar with. So was the Ashkenazi um, Jews in the South who really absorbed this. And that's one kosher soul. That's not the kosher soul of black Surinamese Jews or the kosher soul of Ethiopians or Nigerians or the Limba or the kosher soul of black Jews in Harlem or the kosher soul of black Hasidim or you, you get it. It's not the kosher soul of your colleague, Rabbi Sandra Lawson. 
These are all very different approaches, but what does unite them is this, chicken. I swear to you, I, 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 wanted, to, I wanted to play convenient editor, you know, like Ben Affleck did with Henry Louis Gates. And I, I was like, I can't, I, come on now y'all with the chicken. I mean, it was, it was like deep. The, the, the chicken relationship is deep. Between, it, what, I got that. I think I got things like, I think got that from, um, from Grace, from Will and Grace. Jews and chicken, it's deep. Jews and blacks and Jews and chicken is really deep. And so there, there was another aspect, which was there was an overarching mega kosher soul. Um, I mean, after I interviewed Chef Shambra, who is Muslim from Philadelphia, interviewed my friend Sean um, from, who's, who's a Floribamian, who lives in New York now. I mean, this, this guy is, his guy is so ridiculously lovely. He's like, he's like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big old Scotch Irish um, neck red from Floribama, but I'm going to wear it sisters and, and a keep uh, in New York every day with his, you know, red hair. And one thing I asked, one thing everybody agreed on, whether they were black and Hasidic or black and reconstructionist or just black and Jewish and just raised that way or black and Muslim or Southern Protestant had became Jewish was that this tradition, the, the, the art, the familyhood, the connection, the community, the memories um, of both worlds were so important, you couldn't give them up. There was something to cling to. There was something that had to be passed on and had to be embraced. And that's what kosher soul is. Let me, um, I wanna, I wanna read another little piece and um, it sort of goes back to your original comments about, you know, the, we're, we're talking about the court food, the, the, the high, you know, the high level, the technique, you, you write, um, you were talking about, so you were a teacher for many years and, and I love the stuff you have about Hebrew school. I, I'm waiting for that book. Um, mm -hmm. And sort of using, you know, one way you taught your kids about Jewish culture and Jewish peoplehood through food. Um, and so in, in that section, you write, um, in both cases, meaning the legacies of African Atlantic, African American, and Ashkenazi Jewish culture. So in both cases, the foods of Ashkenazi Jews and Black Americans have been maligned and marginalized along with, right along with the people. If the food was corrupt, so was the beleaguered, antiqu antiquated way of life we no longer have a taste for because it embarrasses us. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating to me because, you know, as you know, like sort of Jewish food is getting trendy now and, you know, Israeli food. But that was really interesting to think about these sort of two food traditions as at either currently or as at one time sort of maligned and a source of shame. I, I, don't, I wonder if you'd say more sort of more about oh, that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The shame comes from being the, being the so-called victim. Why, if they were so smart, if the God was real, if they were so, if they were so on it, how come they didn't uh, overcome their enemies? How come they didn't survive more? How come they weren't more empowered and stronger? You know, everything about them must have been, you know, when I, I heard one person on Twitter talk about Yiddish and said this was the language of our deprivation. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You tell the truth in the language you cry and laugh in. Not to say you can't do that in Ivrit. Ivrit's beautiful, but Ivrit has, you know, had its had its own journey. I mean, we were, we, you know, we kind of like sidestepped Ivrit for a, for a, quite a bit of time for Aramaic. You know, her her um, much more. Um, worldly a sister, shall we say. Read sense. is Hebrew for folks who don't know. Don't yeah, oh, that. thank you, thank you, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So Arami is, you know, kind of like, so look, you look at it that way. But the other part of it is misogyny. Hmm. Let's, 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 let's break this down. So I was at a presentation um, at a forum given by my good um, friend and teacher, Marcy Cohen Ferris. And the Kitchen Sisters were talking about falafel and why certain foods you know, kibbutz foods that were adopted from the Palestinians and other local Arabs. Like, why are these why are some of these foods that took on their own Jewish meaning and Jewish, you know, role? Why were they lauded? Because the food of the balabusta, the food of the of the, of the mame, was the food of the shtetl. The food that kept the, the food. It was it was fatty and it was 
unctuous and it was too sweet and it was this and it was sugar and, it was, it was, and all this other nonsense, right? You hear the same kind of thing when you look at, you know, let's say, for example, Mayor, Mayor Adams, New York. Oh, that soul food will kill you. No, it's not the soul food that's killing you. It's 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 portions. It's 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 how it's prepared. It's it's where it comes from. Is the idea that the comfort food has taken the place of the everyday food. There's a difference. My grandmother, blessed memory, my father's mother, made it to 95. My my grandfather, well, blessed memory, 99, almost 100. His his uh, third wife. Miss, Miss Margaret, 101, eating the traditional Southern food, but not the food that people eat in fast food restaurants. Mm -hmm. Roasted sweet potato, beans and rice, fresh fish from a mill pond, you know, gardens, you know, oak, fresh okra, corn. I mean, I mean, that's that's what it's about. But it's like, you know, but you gotta also talk about returning to the land. And some people view that with suspicion, right? I don't want to be no slave. And I thought it was just the kids. It wasn't just the kids. It was the great migration generation. It was like, uh-uh. Because remember, I, 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 joke, I joke with Jews all the time. They say, well, don't, don't you guys have camp? I said, some of us. But I said, most African-Americans have the experience of being sent to the deep South to be basically farm labor, <laughs> you know, during the summer. And, and, and it wasn't even seen that way. It was seen as you know, very, you know, important connection time with the, with the family, with your roots. Um, but I'm saying that there's a lot in there. There's, there's, there's the, there's a relationship between us and the mother. My mother used to, all, my, mom, my late mom used to always say, that's it, blame the mother. <laughs> I can hear in my ears right now. And, and that's, and that's actually a very common thing. Um, you know, people don't, I think people understand like the, 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 the stereotyped ideal especially in Eastern Europe was, you know, you would live in, in some sort of deprivation and be a bucher, a teenager, a student. And you would go from house to house begging for food, kind of like almost it's sort of, sort of parallel to the Buddhist tradition mm -hmm. where the, you know, you, you know, you, for, for the act of being pious, you get food and alms and things. And, you know, then one day, once you've got all this learning, You'll meet a you you'll you'll be introduced to a shidduch, you know, and the shidduch will will give you this a whole shas, a whole talmud, and the, the you know all, all the prayer books you need, and you can you know do a little bit on the side as a labor, but your predominant labor should be a chacham, be a, be a, a rabbi, a scholar. Um, that's very idealized and actually didn't really happen that often as people think. But the bottom line is is that it's funny to me that we have this. We have this pull, push with our heritages, you know. For the same people who go, ah, ah my kid has to become religious, are the same people who have a rebbe on the wall. The same people who be like, I don't know about no Africa. Are the same people who have like the giraffes and the and the, and, and, and the elephants and the and the baobab trees picture on the wall. So I have to, I have to or or southern images. So I have to ask the question: Which one is it? Do we love our forefathers or foremothers for bringing us to, to for the Shehekiana moment of giving us survival, beyond survival, thriving? Or do we, or, or is it just about loving the nostalgia, nothing else? And the food definitely touches on that. I mean, there's there's still people who are just like, ugh, it's brown, it's gray, it's tasteless, it's bleh, 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 bleh. and you know, but. For real, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 you also have to convince people to remember that nobody had brisket every week in, in Europe. Week, try try every couple of months, if not once a year. You know what I'm saying? So there's this there's this disconnect. You know, people really knew how much herring their ancestors actually ingested. They'd be terrified. I am. I mean, herring is no joke. But I mean, they had hundreds of recipes and just this kind of, not just a, not just frugality. Frugality isn't being cheap. Frugality is being creative and frugality is being investing in your future by, you know, being accurate in the, in the present with what you do. And the cooking was a part of that. I'll give you one more thing. The food was about love. 
It was about love. The world is hurting you, hurting us. You know, what, you know, I learned this from Tahinas. Tahinas are, of course, as you know, the prayers that women said in Yiddish over the challah, over the chillant, over the candles, et cetera. And I absolutely love it because it's, it's, it's the Torah, it's a Torah, of, uh, one, one of the many Torahs of women that existed that we often don't get, we often hear about. But it's this idea that, you know, if I make this chillin delicious, my children will know how much I love them and they will love their children and the generation. I mean, that, that, that kind of like vulnerability and pouring out of the heart is a part of it. And I remember looking on my mother's face when the family would get together and everybody would be satisfied with the food, it would be quiet, they'd be eating. The look of satisfaction. My mother, grandmother would always have to put out candles. And my grandfather would say, uh, you know, do you think you're born of the purple? I said, what does that mean, grandma? I don't mean I'm rich blooded. Mm. But you know what? Guess what? Those candles went out every single time. And it meant, it meant that, you know, what did my grandmother used to say? At this table, God will sit at our banquet. Mm. So yeah, I'm I'm over I'm over the the splaining. I, I I'm I'm all about celebrating. So there was a quote, a, the word nostalgia that you just sort of said. I want to read this little quote and then something that I wrestle with, and I, I would really want your insight. So you wrote, "Fresfunkite," which is not a word I heard. "Fresfunkite," <laughs> my absolute favorite Yiddish word. It means being a Jew through your stomach, being committed to Jewish peoplehood through its flavors and tastes, and being devoted to it as a gourmand. So on the one hand, there's this fresh that you embody, which is incredible, which is you're a learned Jew, you are a teacher of Judaism, you are a historian and recreator of Jewish tradition, and the depth you bring to food, it, you know, and it and the history, um, you know, is, is unbelievable. And then there's the Jews that like sort of break my heart as a rabbi, who like their Jewish identity is so thin that all they have is Jewish food in a very sort of nostalgic right. way. And they're culinary Jews, but I don't mean it in a complimentary way. I mean, there there's nothing there except brisket or gefilte fish and it makes me sad because I feel like that you know Judaism turns into like almost a stereotype of, of Judaism right. as reflected in food so it seems like the opposite of fresh from kite but it looks the same because it's people whose Jewish identity is through their food but but it's not what you're putting out there it's the exact opposite it's 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 like a very thin broth so so and then and at the same time, for a lot of people, that's sort of the only connection they have left, So, which makes me sad. So I, I just love your thoughts on that, because I, I was really thinking about that. Sure. Quote, yeah. you know, what, what, was that, what was that book? What was that book? Um, my, one of my favorites, Ehrlich, uh, Miriam's Kitchen. Mm. And she says, she talks about an article in the college newspaper written by a Black student that's at, back in the 70s, and it goes, what is kosher style? It's all the it's the flavor and the taste and the salt, but no blessing. Hmm. Interesting, you know. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really sold on the idea. There's only one approach. I don't want anybody to, to mis mistake me for thinking that, you know, if you're not glot, you don't belong, or ecoculture isn't a thing, or whatever. I mean, ecoculture, ecoculture, not a thing. I mean, that's all valid to me. I respect people's differences, but what they're talking about is. When and what she was talking about in this book, where she talks about her relationship with her mother and, and, and grandmother and her adopted mother and grandmother, and how Jewish culture and religion becomes much more meaningful through Miriam, Holocaust survivor, is that she wanted to be someone who was kosher, not just kosher style. Um, and she's not hardcore about it, she's like, I just want to slowly. And at my own pace, adopt these things and, and incorporate into my lifestyle and how I look at the world and raise my children, which is all, you know, all good. But that's what happens, you know, and it's and it's and it's a problem that I think a lot of us face in terms of assimilation. You know, um, of course, with, with Jewish peoplehood, it's more complicated than just ethnicity or culture or race or whatever. I mean, all those are part of the this complex. 
But I mean, even with some African American folks, it's like I see the younger generation sometimes they disappoint me because it's obvious they're just like pawing at symbols and stereotypes, but not really de- you know to do this meaningfully to do the kinds of idea with the um, historical um, li- doing living history and other stuff and going deep dives into our history and our and our traditions. It takes an incredible amount of vulnerability. Mm. And it's not lauding myself for that. It is painful. It sometimes, sometimes you forget that you are dragging up stuff that was buried for a reason. But somebody's got to do it. You know, it's like I, I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson hardcore when I was in Ghana. And I was like, you know, for me, all these things combined. I don't they, they never leave anything behind. So I was in Ghana in um, Cape Coast Castle, which is one of the more um, um, articulated sites of the slave trade. And you go into the men's dungeon and it is ominous and it is dark and it is evil. And you look at the walls and the walls, if I may, if I may be clear about this, I thought it was sweat. It wasn't sweat, it was, it was fecal matter. It had been compacted. And so I looked down the wall and uh, an ancestor looked back at me and I began to, to, to cry. And the first words out of my mouth were, Loa how we die. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't say it in English. I'd say it in Hebrew. Loa how we die. I haven't loved enough, you know, um, which is a very popular Israeli folk song. And I realized that the person sitting there in those chains, looking back at me, had to be conscious of every single breath. It had to say the words, I'm going to live. I'm going to live. And I'm going to have children. And those children will have children. I did this. I did this so you could be born. So you need to, you need to, you need to really appreciate you know, that's hard work. And I think for, I think for Yehudim, I think it's also very hard work. I mean, am I doing this because it's tradition? Am I doing this because it's, um, cause I have to do it. Am, does it mean anything to me? You know, and of course it's not just, it's not just um, halakha, it's minha, it's custom, it's law, it's chokim, it's mishpatim, it's, it's all of it, it's all right. The laws that you can explain, the laws you cannot, it's customs, it's family traditions, it's histories. You know, honestly, do we have to ask ourselves the question, do I want, do I want to be engaged in that? Mm-hmm. And other times it's our, our joy can even our joy can be exhausting. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> our joy can be exhausting. We party hard. I wonder why we party hard. I mean, there's a, we all we both know why. Everybody on this on this on this conversation knows why we party hard. But that's 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 part of it. You know, you wake up one day and you go, "I love my people," and my people get on my nerves. And that's just that's just life. <laughs> oh man. Well, you you so you you've sort of I think in your. Uh, by the way, I was in that. I was in that same sp- spot in Ghana. It's 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 mind boggling. It's it's a right. very powerful, very painful place to be. Yeah. Um, so you do many things in the book, uh, and one, I'm going to read a little bit that really I think speaks to one piece. Um, it's a conversation with your friend Greg, wh- who, last name I, I don't remember. Greg with holiday, you. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, Greg. So Greg says, "I'm not your guest. That's what I've centered," and they and. Uh, and Greg is also African-American uh, Jewish person. They aren't my host. I'm a citizen here. My soul was at Sinai. There's nothing more to discuss. We are not white, we're Jews. Y'all also have to accept Spanish Portuguese gave rise to the largest group of black Jews outside of Ethiopia. And then to separate themselves from black people, they began to pass laws to prevent emancipation. One third of the Portuguese Jews in Suriname were black. They had their own synagogue for a year. Beth Elohim and Charleston changed their laws to exclude Jews of color. This isn't black Hebrew stuff. This is actual record. Okay, that's, that's the end of Greg's piece. And then, and then you say, part of the key is cultivating our own histories. I wanted to write a whole chapter piecing together 
these footnotes and endnotes that pass as a history of Black Jews, but that's not good enough. Our story isn't footnotes and endnotes. It's whole burned chapters that have been left out of the Jewish, African, Middle Eastern, Western American and Atlantic history books, a history that dares anyone to imagine us as an exotic novelty. I love that paragraph. I just, you're just really saying that there's, you know, there's a whole different way to tell history. And, and I feel like your book, I, there's, uh, I'm, there's amazing history in it. I mean, it's really, it's, I, I'm wondering how long this took you. I, I, my mother's from Baltimore. I have family from Baltimore that your piece <laughs> on Baltimore, I thought was brilliant. I mean, just how you describe the Jews there and the Jewish community there and its relationship to the, to the black community, but it's, you're really offering us a different way to think about history. It, it feels like. I want, you know, I was reading something about the black immigrants from Ireland during the famine. And this one man makes it all the way to Missouri and they try to treat him as though he's a runaway. And he's like, he's speaking with a brogue and he's, he's ga a full Gaelic speaker. And his papers to prove that he is definitely an Irishman, but he's of African descent. Hmm. Like, whoa. And then there's that, um, I didn't put it in a book and I kind of like regret it, but I, but I always want to make sure I had everything accurate. There was some passage from some paper talking about a, um, a, a black man who showed up at a synagogue of the 19th century and the rabbi is like, you know, was pen, was kind of like uh, apprehensive, but he kind of, you know, quizzes him and he's like, oh yeah, he's the real thing. He's Jewish, he's like us. And it's just like, how many of these people existed? And, that, and, and if they existed to the point where they could be excluded, there's a number. I mean, there's a number of people um, and that they have a whole history. Um, um, I, 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 oh, I, by the way, I'm kind of, I'm being random here, but um, hi, Joni, the recipes are, all, all the recipes in kosher, solo kosher. That was big, that was important to me. I mean, kosher, I mean, cooking gene is different because cooking gene is more like, you know, wasn't, it was for everybody. Kosher sells for everybody too, but the recipes are all kosher. Yes, I wanted to make sure that was a thing. And I'm, I'm sad to do more fish recipes, but I'm, I'm not a big uh, dagim fish guy, but um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll do an addendum somewhere on the internet, but yeah, just to, just to make sure you knew. But um, yeah, but, but like, but to your question, like it's, um, I'm fascinated by border crossers. I'm fascinated by the, the places that, you know, we should know more about, because I don't like amnesia. I like memory. I like history. I like, but I also like traditions. And it's and it's weird how people go, yeah, that's laughable. And then next thing you know, it's like, no, that's a thing. I mean, how many people know that, for example, this this fascinates me. The the oldest Asian community in Europe is Liverpool. By 250 years. All those British, all, all those British ships that went to China brought people back, and they came back. Um, pa Panama has the Western Hemisphere's oldest Chinese community. So I mean, this turns on its head the idea that oh, you know, and of course we know they were Jewish pirates. We know there were you know Jewish gold miners. We knew that there we know they're Jewish cowboys and Jewish um, gauchos, and it's just like dang. You know, it's just, there is this, there's this whole, you know, other history, all, all keys to an alternative reality that we all should know about. Yeah. So someone asked about recipes. Uh, there's a whole beautiful section of the book that's about gardens. Um, and you really invite us to like, which I do a little bit of gardening, but just the thought that we should, you really want to take it seriously. I, I want to read the, this little bit about the gardens and then ask you to talk about why you included sure. it. So uh, you write, for lack of an alternative history, we have this consistent theme in Black Jewish engagement that centers around trauma, the victimizers, cruelty, trophies, and scary dominance and shadow over our lived realities. These are not to be fully avoided. For the discussion of these to be absent is to be dishonest. And yet, purely being trauma-centered and death-centered often sends people the other way. For me, teaching and learning about our people's glories and joys and vibrancy is where we need to have balance. Cultural gardens have been for me and my work a way and means towards healing. Gardens say a culture was not completely destroyed. 
Many lives were taken or diminished in the Ma'afa, the Inquisition, pogroms, or the Shoah. But many strong elements of the cultures that suffered so much are here and present. And you go on to tell the stories that different plants tell you. How did you come to like include this whole section on, on gardens? And then you actually have sort of lists of what uh, different kinds of gardens might look like if we want to be, you know, creating our own gardens and then cooking from them. It's because, uh, you know, I met Shani Mink of the Jewish Farmers Network. And she's an incredible uh, wisdom teacher for someone who is so young. Mm. Um, and, you know, she talks, that, that's whole, that whole section is preceded by a conversation with her talking about the benefits of Jews returning to the land. And the one thing she said what got me the most was how like she was doing something down at a uh, Pearlstone and there was a, a gleaning and some people came in from the local, um, you know, Litvakish community. And she's talking about Maser and, and tithing. And a little boy who, you know, doesn't know how to, doesn't read her as Jewish, even though she's Jewish as he is, and was raised Orthodox, um, says, well, you know, why is that girl talking about Maser? For him, for him, it was just something you read about and study in. It's biblical, you know, right? It's, it's biblical. It has no, it has no practical meaning or reality. Yeah. But they're like, no, let's let's put this into practice. What is what does tithing and gleaning and sharing and creating community based on that really mean look like? Not just when you know Mashiach comes, but like right now, in this space. So it's like, I was like, I I I'd already done these gardens, but she you know, resurrected in me that that urge to kind of like say, okay. Let's try to plant a garden that shows, you know, um, the connection to the past. So, so it's not just like plant carrots. I went and looked for varieties of carrots that would have been grown in northern, eastern, and southeastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, from Sephardic perspective, the kind of, you know, eggplants. That, the egg, Turkey has a thousand and one eggplants. So, you know, finding plants from Turkey and Morocco and Syria and Libya and Lebanon and all these other places. Um, where Sfarim have lived and Mizrahim have lived and just kind of like, what does that garden look like? And showing at African-American, Afro-Caribbean garden, what does that look, why is that important? Again, it's about love, it's about beauty. I mean, it's not just about, hey, we can get extra food. It was, oh, wow, look at the beauty of those fresh vegetables. I mean, can you, I mean, when, when you, when you're hurt, when you're traumatized, when you're a victim of other people's stuff, those little things mean so much to you. I know that because I had grandparents who lived that life. You know, they they could tell you about my grandmother loved crepe myrtles and she loved certain things. You know, there was always that comment about you know my other grandmother said, "Oh, that's a that's some pretty tobacco." You know, he would think that she would never want to ever see this plant again. Mm -hmm. That she had to work in fields. But you look at that. Oh, it's a pretty tobacco. <laughs> it's just like it's it's strange. It's like the, the pleasure that my grandfather would get from seeing a cleared field. Like, mm hmm, that's it. Yeah. I mean that that's that people have to realize that that was part of our ancestors' joy. It got them through life. It can get us through life. It can, you know, it, it, you know, if it gives you an opportunity to say a, one of the hundred brachas, brachot of the day, then boch Hashem. If it gives you the opportunity, you know, it's it's like I, she's controversial and problematic, but I, I can't, I can't, I can't lie and say that one of the most important books in my life was the color purple, mm -hmm. where you know there's that there's that you know the the the, the thesis the book has a thesis and the thesis is. It makes God angry if you walk by the color purple in the field and don't acknowledge it and don't love it, you know? So, I mean, all of these things come together for me. It, it, it's, <laughs> Rabbi, I am, I, am, I am burdened, but I'm happy because I, 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 I can't look at anything without seeing the bright side. It's true. I mean, you... I in this book, it's really quite remarkable that you don't shy away from, you know, oppression and the ways that you've been 
you know, not treated well in the Jewish community and other places, but it's, it's, and, but then there's always the story about the love and the get in and, um, and, and yeah, it's, it's quite, you, you hold it all. It's really quite, it's quite amazing. Let me read one more little section and then you can respond. And then I think sure. some questions. So, um, in this, this whole section, my Afro Ashkafardi kitchen, which I love, um, when I wrote my own notes where it's a beautiful meditation on how cooking and eating become sacred in both in Jewish and African cultures from planting to harvesting to cooking. Um, and then you write, space can be wholly meaningful and important in contemporary American culture. Oh, sorry, in contemporary American culture, kitchens can be dirty and kitchens can be cluttered. But how often do you see people ask the question, is your kitchen sacred? Mm -hmm. We'll leave wholly the whole alone because that is a far more subjective question than whether your kitchen is sacred. I guess I feel the need to say this because sacred does not need to have a specific religious or spiritual context, even though in my case, they absolutely do and beyond. And then you go on to talk about how one makes a kitchen sacred with old treasured, you know, cookbooks or pictures of the family or kids, you know, drawings up on the fridge. I know in my mother's house, my mother might be on there somewhere. When the new fridge came and it wasn't magnetic, this was like a disaster. Like <laughs> there were no more pictures on the fridge. This was very bad. This, the non-magnetic fridge was a very bad fridge. Um, but anyway, but you just talk about what happens around the table, you know, as being sacred. And I think it's really interesting because I you you do emphasize kashrut a, a lot in, in the book, and and I, and you're 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 an observant Jew. I I have my own food practice, but I do eat. I'm a pescatarian. I eat shellfish. I don't eat meat, so I'm not technically kosher. Um, and most Jews I know who are my congregants don't keep traditionally kosher. Although most Jews I know have a food practice of some sort, like there are mm -hmm. things for ethical reasons or other reasons they won't eat. Um, so I think it's really interesting to think about how you know you're saying that eating, you know, and the the act of shared eating and cooking in both African American and Jewish cultures ideally, I, you know, it's to create sacred space. And I just love you here to talk more about that, especially if one is not maybe completely bound by traditional kashrut. So, um, for example, um, one of the things I did to make my kitchen in my, my new home sacred was to hang my mother's, grandmother's, and great-grandmother's hot comb on the wall. Hmm. You know, because, you know, the kitchen was a place where you put the hot comb on the stove, you did each other's hair. There was talking. Hair for what? For family stuff, for church stuff, for this or that. Okay. Everybody did that. Um, but I did it at an angle like a mezuzah. Yeah. And today, today I kissed it before I left the house. I, I, you know, I wanted their strength with me. Um, you know, sacred, I know a lot of people, you know, they may not keep an anti-kosher any time of year, but when Pesach comes, the, the rabbi couldn't make their house holier. There's something special about that. There's something very special about the way that, you know, I've seen people make those exceptions and they may not think much of it, but I think it's a lot. I think also being being very um, aware of what you're eating and why. Why this, but not this? What, I mean, I don't have these conversations with people who don't get it or don't want to get it or don't know about it. Or, you know, if you don't, if you really feel like there's only one way, then we'll keep our conversation within that sayak, within that fence. But the other version is, Oh yeah, you know, being mindful and being thoughtful about what I'm eating is a very Jewish practice. Mm -hmm. You know, understanding. I remember one person said to me, I can't eat X company, I'm not gonna say their name, X company's meat anymore because of what came out about them. And they said, that's not kosher for me anymore. I don't care. I can't give my children that. I'm ashamed. That's that's deep. That's there's a there's a lot in that. There's a lot in that. Um, you know, I am I'm just floored by the fact that this conversation that we're having is part of a conversation that has been going on for a very long time. Although I'm sure 
I'm sure the people who started this conversation never imagined the two of two, uh, us two lovely having it. Right? <laughs> the lesbian rabbi and the, the, the black gay dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the wildest <laughs> dreams. I don't think Michael. No, they didn't. <laughs> right, but but I mean that that in and of itself is is a nice. It's a miracle. It is. It is. It means there's no there's no. Nobody gets left out. You know, I, I should say that before we move on to, to questions and things, is that I, I, it was really important to me to put that whole section in about, you know, making sure you had all four species and all, all of the all of the spices. The idea is the same. You cannot leave any part out and make it whole. We have to be mindful. You know, people who just say you you're not, you're not one of us. It's not Jewish. Not Jewish. Jewish is. I don't know how to deal with you, but there's there's plenty of cocoa for everybody. You know, and that's that's why I'm here. I mean, part of this book is a love letter to Jewish peoplehood. We've had a, we have we keep having hard times. Shved to signing it. I I get it. So it's been in the, it's on the chat. But I am I'm. In love with being Jewish, but but I'm not I'm not um, as I put it, make it very plain in the book, I'm not naive. I'm not nostalgic about it. Judaism taught me how to love um, with open eyes. With open eyes, um, Judaism has taught me how to learn from women in a greater way than I did before. Okay, when you come from a very you know patriarchal tradition. Um, and there's an, there's an ambiguous space for women's spirituality and power and learning. It's very different when you're in another space where, you know, women women um, express themselves, you know, in so many different ways that show devotion, connection, and, and community building. And last but not least, Judaism has taught me, you know, that... You know, everybody has a meaning and a purpose and a light. You know, <laughs> you know the, the funniest thing to me is, you know, making shidduch, whether you really make it or not. Because I'm just thinking to myself, it's a value in our tradition for the Adam creature not to be alone. And that I care about you so much that I, 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 I want you to be loved and intimate and cared for and uh, and and connected. What a, what, a, what a delightful present from Hashem. What a delightful present that we look out for each other. Or that we don't always have to have God to be godly. Mm. You know, I'm crying. I don't know why I'm crying. I'm crying. I, I know I'm crying. Because they say in the, the Dagara people in West Africa, they say, when you tell the truth, it melts down your face. Mm -hmm. You have that in the book. I love that. Yeah. Aye, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Silas, did you want to open it up or? Hi there. Thank you so much for that. First thing I'm going to do is drop the link to the book in the chat. Uh, so if you want to buy it, you can do so. It comes with a signed book plate by the author. Um, the other thing I'll do is if you put a question in the chat, please pop it in the Q&A box. It's a separate box. Um, if you've raised your hand, you can put anything in the Q&A box and we'll get to it there. So we have a question from Hannah Lee, which is, Michael, where do you feel at home? In any special community, where do you feel accepted? And this question is open to either of you. Whoa. Rabbi, I know they said, Michael, but da 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 but how would you answer that question? Because you've lived in different places and learned and taught and, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, me personally, I, it's so interesting. I don't think I ever waited to feel accepted anywhere. I don't, I don't know that that's, you know, hmm. so, you know, I think places where I feel at home or places that share my my values. I think, you know, I grew up in the youth movement Habonim and it was a place where, 
you know, being a smart, funny girl was a, was was a, was an okay thing to be. So I think I felt mm-hmm. at home there, you know, even though it was very heterosex at the time. And I, I think when I found the Reconstructionist world, and I was like, oh, these are people who, you know, I had stopped I had stopped saying the part of the liturgy that called Jews the chosen people, and I found out there's a whole movement that didn't <laughs> me feeling accepted as about you know how do you find your people and you know and I right. communities I'm a part of but um you know and I like to say there's no you know and I don't think there's any one community or any one group that represents all parts of me so maybe you know I think the one thing you do in the book I feel like is show all the different communities you're you're a part of and I don't know if there's one place you feel that but clearly you've got you've got lots of Lonsman you know in many different places right and then you know that's and I think that's what people need to understand is that there's some people you know I made a, I made a point of saying talking about Rabbi Ham Frazier and um, Rabbi Yisrael Francis, it's two Black men. One is, you know, Litvakish, one Hasidic. But, you know, when it comes to community relations, they're Black. When it comes to everything else, they're just Jewish. There's none of this fusion like with me. And so I had to kind of understand that, you know, there are places where not all of you is going to be welcome. You know, if you remember that particular section, that's a section where I go into 770 and yeah. there's a queer man who walks in. Yeah, it was very powerful. Wow. He, I mean, it, it flipped me out because I just said to myself, this is a thing. This was just for folks who haven't read the book. It's like a flamboyant, sort of a, a fairly, fairly flamboyant in, in, a, in, in, in 19th century garb. If one can be a flamboyant right. in 19th century garb, this this young man was doing that. And, and Michael, somebody, especially for somebody who does living history stuff <laughs> and the, the layers and levels of, of drag there, but not drag. I, I mean, he was, I mean, he, he was the embodiment of, I am you but I am not you. Mm-hmm. And he did not, and he obviously pushed back against the negativity and the judgment. And here I am having to kind of like, not hide, but not really fully blossom in front of this group of people. And I don't know, he was the brave one that day. Mm-hmm. And so, so I guess the question, I guess the question is, is that I'm, I'm, I'm learning that you have to build it. I mean, as a queer person, I mean, obviously, I've had a lot of struggles with belonging. You know, I mean, if you look at the beautiful work that uh, Michael R. Jackson did with A Strange Loop, do fat black gay men belong? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we, we create this culture. You know, we, we, we move this. We make this happen. We are Paris is burning. We we are pose, we are legendary, we are all of that, but you know, we're still limited. Um do you know what is it what does it mean when you know and there are other scholars and authors and thinkers are like, okay, what happens when you're trans and male and black and of size? What happens there? All of it. I mean, I'm so glad these questions are being asked. I do not care if it makes people angry. I do not care if it makes people uncomfortable. I want a revolution. And that revolution is as simple as I'm here, he nanny. So, you know, finding your place, you know, that word alone, right? Makom Mm -hmm. is a euphemism for Hashem. Mm -hmm. The place, the God. You know, when, when Hazal, when the rabbis say, how do you change your fate? You change your place. You know, like where, how many times are you going to change your place in life? What's going to settle you into the space that you need to be an ancestor? These are really deep ultimate questions, but you know, we try. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, another question that we have is from Joni. What is your favorite recipe from your grandmother and what is your favorite spice or spice combo for simple roast chicken well so that you guys mentioned it i have a collection of spice through spice tribe and by the way we are working to get them hexure there's nothing in them that's not kosher and they're salt free so that's one thing but working to get them hexured for those who need them hexured and that collection has my grandmother's chickens chicken spice 
Um, it has my West African heritage spice, kitchen pepper, and an antebellum barbecue mix. Nothing in this not kosher. We're working to get them hectured and we're working on some kosher soul spice as well. So if that if you're willing to be daring and just go on that, you know, please buy some and from Spice Tribe and uh, flavor that chicken and it'll give it at least a day. You know, of course, I know sodium is an issue. For me, it's become a, a dietary issue that I have to address. But, um, you know, do do salt your chicken to some degree. At least put a teaspoon of sea salt in that, on that, on that piece. And then, you know, watch a portioning. But the, the spices themselves will, will do a good job. That little, that little bit of olive oil, a little lemon, a little balsamic, you'll be fine. It'll be the best Shabbos chicken you ever had. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, oh, we've got a lot of questions. Who people who want the link to that spice website? <laughs> Can people find to buy those spices that you just mentioned? Okay, let's see here. If I'm trying to figure out um, here, let's see if I can do it. Yeah. Da, 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 da. So there we go. Someone put it in the chat. Okay, great. Fabulous. Great, great. And if anyone has, we have time for one more question. So if anyone wants to uh, ask a question in the Q&A section, but otherwise- uh, One paragraph I want to just yeah. want to read to close or to close my part. So whenever you're ready. Sure. Oh. So anyway, I just this this little piece um, from early. It's, it's pretty early in the. Oh, I I have a question, Michael. What the hell sure. is the Manischewitz cocktail? Oh my gosh! <laughs> you and Tamla Smith are sitting there drinking Manischewitz cocktail. I'm like, was, what in the world is that? What is that? It was some. It was some place in Toronto during the Ashkenaz festival, <laughs> and we went out and we had this Manischewitz cocktail. I don't know what was in it. I know that it was pretty basic. And pretty purple, <laughs> and I, I learned. I, I, I got. I want to go back there so bad because I found that the Toronto Jewish community had really, had really embraced a lot of things that a lot of American Jewish communities had, you know. But it was because they were a little bit younger, and a little bit more connected. It was about, and, and it was a very different relationship. But yeah, I got to find out. I got to remember what where we went to. They had that Manischewitz cocktail. I don't know. Uh, that just that crap. It was purple. <laughs> I found that Manischewitz actually makes great sangria because it's already sweet. All right, absolutely. This, this is the piece I wanted to read. Uh, so this is Michael writing. I cook and teach to be counted. I learn the history of every dish and ingredient and names and geographies to be counted. Just like I study the history of the ancestors to count the ones who came before us. I know how e easy it is to obscure the culture makers, to erase the creators and say they never were. I do this work so that someone will look for my number among the, the censuses that don't know me by name and never asked. I create food so there will be a trail to find us by, something to start a legacy. I, I just, that just feels like a, a mission statement that I, I love and I just wanna just offer gratitude that you're con both continuing a legacy and starting a legacy and doing it in conversation with so many people and clearly you have many fans here. Um, so I'm gonna say to everybody, buy this book and buy it for your friends. It's <laughs> yes, fabulous. Please. It's fabulous. And I've only seen it as a PDF, I'm sure in the actual physical bookness. I wanna, I wanna point one last thing out, one last thing yeah. out. My husband did these halot because when we were designing the cover, I said, I want a, I want a hollow that represents every part of me. Is that the rainbow hala you were talking about? A rainbow hala. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Blue white hala, a <laughs> black, red, and green hala, and a hala that's all the above. That's awesome. That's awesome. So when people open this, the first before you even open the book, there's all the parts of me braided together on the table. Anyhow, you all have been great. Thank you, um, Brookline Booksmith. Thank you, Rabbi Toba. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everybody who's been here. Um, this is a really great way to, to start something that... Um, means a lot to me and I hope it means a lot to you. Yes, thank you so much. We're so excited to celebrate this release. Buy the book now, the link is in the chat, it comes with a signed book plate by Rabbi Toba's book, God is Here, uh, that also came out recently. 
Thank you so much to both of you. This was such a powerful conversation. We are truly blessed to have been a part of this. And thank you for supporting an independent bookstore. Yay. See you guys later. Thank you all. Thank Michael, you.